Are you learning about MTHFR and methylation? Maybe you're wondering about this concept of overmethylation symptoms versus undermethylation symptoms. My name is Dr. Tara Nella, and in this video, we're going to talk about some of these principles, the complexity of the overall methylation process, and how balance is really the key thing to be looking for and how you can use these principles of overmethylation versus undermethylation as a guide, but not necessarily a diagnostic to understand where there may be gaps in your balance. And lastly, we'll talk about how this needs to be applied to each individual and some objective measurements like lab testing that you can use to help verify some of these symptoms so you have an objective measurement to go along with the symptomatic measurement. As I said, my name is Dr. Taranella, and this video, like all my videos, I make to help you go beyond basic health. But this video isn't designed or tailored specifically for an individual, so please read this medical disclaimer before we jump into the video details. <laughs> So here in this video, we're going to look at overmethylation symptoms versus undermethylation symptoms. But the process of over and undermethylation in the body is actually quite complex. As you'll come to understand, the relationship between methylation and its symptoms is a bit more subtle than the popular binary approach seems to suggest. Still, we can use certain symptoms to better understand what steps to take in different situations when it comes to your health and when you're trying to optimize things. So the first thing to understand is that when we talk about methylation, we're referring to the addition of a methyl group molecule onto another molecule. And methyl donors such as folate or methylfolate and methyl B12, SAMe, etc., they play a crucial role in this process. However, it's essential to also recognize that the manifestations of symptoms that may come on from taking these things or not taking them isn't really a one-size-fits-all scenario. The symptoms associated with these methyl donors is not necessarily from a uniform increase or lack of the addition of a methyl group occurring all throughout your body. For instance, taking a methyl donor like SAMe or methylfolate doesn't automatically lead to a global increase in this methylation process everywhere. Our bodies have a very intricate and sophisticated way to regulate these processes and involves feedback mechanisms from things like the level of SAMe, the level of homocysteine, environmental drivers of epigenetic changes of DNA, and various other cellular signaling pathways. So that may seem a bit abstract, but the message that I'm trying to get across is that the overall methylation process isn't really about more or less. It's about trying to give your body the balance that it itself is trying to achieve. And sometimes we may overshoot the mark by giving too much of something and the body has to deal with all that excess or it may not have enough and it has to create strategies to try and compensate for that lack. So with that general information out of the way and explained, many people want to know more so about the symptoms of overmethylation or undermethylation. And in a real sense, that question is really concerned about, do I need to take more methyl donors because I'm undermethylated or do I need less methyl donors because I'm overmethylated? And we can really think about these as categories of symptoms versus the biological processes that are associated with methylation. The idea was originally described in the context of mental health by Dr. William Walsh. And while symptoms alone are not super reliable, they can provide us a pretty decent guide. And as described by him, overmethylation can include things like anxiety, hyperactivity, and obsessive compulsive tendencies, while undermethylation may include things like depression, oppositional behavior, or even low motivation. And it's not clear to me if these symptoms are reliable as standalone diagnostics. I mean, they don't appear to be. For instance, you're not taking any methyl donors and you're depressed, therefore you need more methyl donors. Is that going to apply in every instance? Or if you're anxious or have more obsessive tendencies, should you avoid them? I would especially call this into question on the overmethylation side of symptoms. But I think you get into a 
difficulty with semantics. I wouldn't necessarily avoid giving any methyl donors just because someone said they were anxious or obsessive. For instance, someone could be anxious and depressed at the same time or feel fatigued and depressed and also have obsessive thoughts. Still, in my clinical experience, I do find these principles of treating people with methyl donors for various mental health issues very helpful. I do see those with more of a depressive low energy type phenotype do better with methyl donors and those with more anxiety have a tendency to do worse with them, but it's not universal. So I think we just have to be careful with how we're applying these principles. The general idea is not really about a checklist, but understanding the cues that your body gives and if and when you decide to use or start taking some of these methyl donors. Each person, of course, has a unique biochemistry and a unique makeup and what works for one person isn't necessarily going to work for the other. Doesn't mean you can't use these principles and ideas of over and under methylation. You just have to not forget to reevaluate after some time. The concept of over methylation symptoms versus under methylation symptoms is a valuable tool for understanding your body's needs or perhaps lack of methyl donors. However, it's not really a biochemical truth. It's more about fine-tuning your body's signals and finding the right balance for what's going on with your particular health. In my practice, I do use this fine-tuning approach looking at symptoms in over-methylation or under-methylation, but I also use other objective measurement and variables like the MCB blood test, the homocysteine levels, and high homocysteine and high MCB, for instance, can also be an indicator for the need for more methyl donors. Nothing in the human body should be looked at in absolute terms. Each person needs to be looked at as an individual, but these principles can be very helpful and useful in helping you fine-tune your health. There are other labs and metrics that we sometimes use as well to help you understand if you need more methyl donors or less methyl donors. And I discuss these principles and ideas more in my book on MTHFR and B12, as well as other videos on the general term of methylation and MTHFR. So definitely check those out. You can find links to all those in the description, as well as my course on MTHFR. So hopefully that gives you a better understanding on overmethylation symptoms versus undermethylation symptoms. If you do have questions about anything in this video, definitely drop them in the comment. If you want a more expanded, useful response to some of your questions, consider joining the membership where I'll be able to dedicate more time and attention to your questions. And if you want to continue getting videos like this, click on the like button and subscribe to the channel to continue getting these videos. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.